So last week we uh, started a short series um, as we get ready for the new year called Engaging the Father. New Year's resolutions are helpful. Man, cleaning up my house and doing a spring clean and reorganizing is going to benefit me. Healthier living and uh, exercising and, and eating, you know, those are good things to think about and will benefit me in the long run. But if I'm going to think about something, I want to think about how to engage the Father more. And so what we did last week was kind of set up what Jesus teaches about engaging with the Father. So uh, we dived into Matthew chapter 6. So you can turn there because we'll be back there today. But just as a recap to set up this week's message, what Jesus taught was how we can pray and talk to our Father. And as we looked into maybe a well-known passage, we saw two interesting things. And the first one is this, I don't have to be like the hypocrites and the Pharisees who try to be seen by standing in public places when they pray. No, my faith as a believer is that I go completely alone. Jesus says, go into your room, close the door where no one sees you but your Father who sees you, and you can pray. And as I engage with the Father, the faith step and the joy for me is I have a Father who sees me. And so I can be alone and have courage and faith that I pray to Him and Him alone because He sees me. And the second point that we took out of that is I don't have to be like the pagans who think they're heard because they keep babbling and repeating themselves over and over and over again. That's how I'm heard. No, we've got a Father who knows what we need before we even ask Him. And the foundation that I have as a follower of Jesus is that my Father sees me and He knows what I need before I even ask. So I get to engage with that as my basis. And now He carries on going more into this prayer. And, and so what I want to deal with, with this is like, okay, that's all good and well, but what happens when things are tough? Because we live in South Africa and it's tough. Right? There is pressure all round. I think none of us are going through this life without financial pressure, health pressure, relational pressure, uh, stress all round. And we find it really difficult because you're going, well, if he sees me and he knows what I need, why is it so hard all the time? And why do I feel like if you've ever been to the beach and you're walking through like water and the current, like you're wading through heavy stuff and there's always, always pressure? Well, I hope that this message is going to be of some real encouragement to you as it has been for me. And as I shared with you last week, I'm not the, the kind of person who just reads Scripture every day for the sake of reading Scripture. I'll sit maybe in the same passage for a very long time as the Lord is just dealing with me, and I, and I like to mine something quite deep. And I feel like last year the Lord really did this with this passage, especially in Matthew chapter 6, because it's Jesus' foundational teaching on how to engage with the Father. So, after he sets up more of the heart of it, he goes, then this is how you should pray. So, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, passage that might be quite familiar to many of you. So, he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but... Deliver us from the evil one. As I said again, passage known really well if you've been in church for some time. But here are some quick thoughts from it that have really uh, just helped me this past year. So, right, the engagement with my father is personal, right? We see that at the start. My father, our father. Jesus is continually reminding us about how personal it is when we engage with our Father. And it's important that right at the start, and man, that, that song that we sung, just how holy and great our Father actually is. And when we're engaging, I'm always reminded, my personal Father is the one who spoke the universe into being. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is holy. There is nothing that can compare to him, and that is who I'm engaging with. And then the second kind of line in it is, then let me pray, your kingdom come on earth, your will be done. 
And then he goes, give us today our daily bread. And, and something that I find so striking when I read that is those two things are so vastly different in their scope. So Jesus is teaching us how to engage with the Father. He's teaching us to pray. And so there's our Father. He's holy. There's nothing like Him. Seek His kingdom. Pray your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Right? How big is that prayer? How big is that line? And then He says, give us today our daily bread. That's actually quite small. That's a small thing in comparison to this big thing. And this is something that I actually find that we confuse as believers. That we actually flip completely around. Because we are so consumed with our financial security and our well-being. Now, understandably, life is expensive, right? We need to work. We need to pay for our house. We need to pay for school fees and varsity and everything that we need in our lives. So we are always hustling. Something about Johannesburg is people are always working. People are always pushing. We're just chasing and chasing and chasing because life's expensive. We're always in the car. We're always working. Our minds are always focused uh, on our jobs, and, and it's tough. But something about this prayer needs to reorientate our thinking because he prays and he teaches us to engage. Seek first the kingdom. Pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done, but then just give me my daily bread. Very different to how we behave as, as people. And we get caught up in this pressure. But now this phrase, give us our daily bread. Really interesting phrase. Now when thinking about that uh, I want us to go to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse, from verse 1. So Deuteronomy 29 verse 1, it is going to be up on the screen. So now this is Moses speaking to God's people, the Israelites, as they're about to enter into what is known as the promised land, their inheritance, the, the land that God had set up for them. And it says, these are the terms of the covenants the Lord commanded Moses to make with the Israelites in Moab, in addition to the covenant he had made with them at Horeb. Moses summoned all of Israel, and he said to them, Your eyes have seen all the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh, to all his officials, and to all his land. With your own eyes you saw those great trials, those signs and great wonders, but to this day, the Lord has not given you a mind that understands, or eyes that see, or ears that hear. Yet the Lord says, during the 40 years I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did your sandals on your feet. You ate no bread and drank no wine or other fermented drink. I did this so that you might know that I am the Lord your God. So a little bit of context here. God's people, uh, the Israelites, uh, who he had said, I'm your God, you are my people. They were in slavery in Egypt for about 400 years. And uh, during that time, they prospered. They became this great nation. And then God took them out of slavery, out of Egypt, and into the land that was going to be theirs. So it was just like a couple of families into this great nation, many tribes. Now he's taking them in to fulfill all that he had promised to them. They're about to enter in. They're literally on the boundary line, and they, they harden their hearts. They hear reports. They get scared. They get cold feet, and they decide, I'm not going to trust my God who has just taken me out of Egypt, who's done all of this stuff for me. We, we're not going to trust him. And so God then brings some consequences. And as a nation, they conquer in. They have to wander the desert for 40 years. And I love and I hate this, and I'll, I'll explain why. Because... God goes, oh, so you don't trust me. All right, I'm going to prove a bit of a point here. Go walk the desert for 40 years as a nation. They reckon nearly 3 million people maybe. Right? 3 million people on foot walking the desert for 40 years. Can't plant crops. Can't really farm. No way to do any kind of economic planning and make provision for yourselves. You can do nothing. You're just wandering for 40 years. And what does the Lord do? 
He goes, he has food every morning, food every evening. You can't buy new clothes, that's fine. Your clothes aren't going to wear out. 40 years, their clothes don't wear out. You've got to walk for 40 years. You can't buy new shoes, that's fine. Your shoes. The soles of your shoes that you walk on for 40 years are not going to wear out. In Deuteronomy 5, Moses tells the same story. It says your feet didn't even swell. Right? You do some hiking. You know what it's like when you take your feet off after a long day. Your feet are sore. They could not even complain about sore feet after walking every day for 40 years. Why did this happen? Because God is a God who takes care and provides for the needs of his people. I wonder at what point in those 40 years did they finally like light bulb? Like we can trust God. Like it's actually okay. I mean, I wonder how many times did they wake up in the morning and there was the manna and in the evening there was the quail and it's like year 23, day 300 and I've got the same pair of shoes and they're in mint condition. I wonder at what point did they go, God's doing something here. Again, like, I mean, think about it. I wonder when they went, okay, God, we get it. You are worth trusting with my needs. And I should never have doubted you because you take care of what I need. Isn't it just amazing how he proved himself? Now, what, what, what kind of slaps me with this passage is this was a nation who didn't believe and who didn't trust who hardened their hearts towards God and were sinful in their actions towards Him. And what does God do in response to that? Right, there were consequences. That generation didn't enter in, and their children did. But to those who didn't believe, God still takes care of their very basic needs. And not one day in 40 years did they go without. Is our God worth trusting with our daily basic needs. Man, and this is why I battle with this so much, and I'm often preaching to myself, because this heart of mine is, is so bad sometimes, because I know this, and I've experienced this, and then my heart can still go, but God, are you going to come through for me? And so when we say, Lord, my daily bread, this is a prayer of faith. And when Jesus is teaching us to pray this, is do I trust that God is going to provide what I need and what my family needs? Again, this goes counter to the culture of Joburg. We're always supposed to be pushing. We're always trying to increase and to have enough. Again, nothing wrong with having a job. Nothing wrong with having a house. Nothing wrong with working hard. Nothing wrong with having a freezer where we plan our food out for the month because financially that makes a bit more sense because it's cheaper to, to buy like that. But at the heart of this is do I trust him for my needs so that I can pray your kingdom come, your will be done and I can put my focus and my priority into being about his business and his agenda because he takes care of what I need. And I don't have to worry about what I need because I know that he knows my needs. He sees me. He knows my needs before I even ask it. So I can pray, Jesus, what's your will? I want to do that. And Jesus, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I want to be about that. I want to concern myself with that. That's a big prayer, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, I'm concerned about that. And so then I can just pray, Jesus, take care of my needs, my daily bread. And as I think and orientate around that, I think it's so much more helpful when I think about all my worries and my anxieties. And I have so many testimonies around this. Uh, last year, 2022, was a, was a tough year in many ways. And uh, privileged enough to be able to have medical aid savings. Uh, but you know what is uh, the catch with medical aid savings? Those of you who have it, it runs out. <laughs> Ours ran out in June. Now, you can imagine when your savings runs out in June, we had some real anxiety around that. Guess how many times we needed the doctor from June? Zero. Zero. So when 
the Israelites' shoes, the soles of their shoes didn't wear out and their clothing didn't perish. Once our financial savings or medical savings, our provision there ran out, we didn't need the doctor. The Lord just took care of our health. That's just one of many testimonies. That's just a personal one for us. As we just trusted God, we prayed, God, do you know what we need? And we prayed, and I prayed, God, our our finances are tough. Uh, Kids started coughing, and we're like, oh, my gosh. Jesus, you know what we need. And they didn't get sick. We didn't get sick, and we stayed healthy, and the Lord just took care of us. And so we need to orientate our thinking around this because he says, give us today our daily bread, not our daily A5 Wagyu. If you don't know what that is, it's the most expensive kind of meat you can get. It doesn't say give us our daily takeouts. And so while takeouts are nice and eating, that's not what he promises. He promises our needs being met. And so I'm so grateful because I have a house and I have a car and I, my family has their health and we didn't go hungry in 2022 as tough as it was sometimes. And we saw time and time again that he just took care of our needs. And so we could be about his business all the time because he takes care of our needs. And so as you're thinking about this, church, a couple of things. You can engage the Lord around your finances. And I encourage you to engage with the Lord around your finances with good wisdom and and, and good financial sense and budgeting and not being foolish and then trusting him that what you have is enough. And I think with applying wisdom and faith, he takes care of his people. And so to give your financial anxiety to him and say, Jesus, I'm trusting you. You said, pray for my daily bread. I'm, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to provide for my family, but I want to be about your business. Please take care of us financially. It's okay to engage with him around those things. Engage and pray to the Father about your health. I know so many of us are concerned about our health needs, but with just, again, wisdom and just being wise around what we do with our lives and our body and our eating and sleeping, we can trust that the Lord is going to sustain our health. And it's okay to give all our anxieties over to Him. Your work anxieties, your family anxieties, uh, the, the stress in your relationships, and even pray, God, give me my daily bread for my marriage. If your marriage is under strain, to say, God, give me what I need to love my wife well today and to love my children well today and to love my husband well. You know, God, give me my daily bread for my office. Man, I'm, it's tough at work, but I, I, I'm trusting that you will give me what I need to get through today. And then as we close out the short series, the whole point about this, in engaging with the Father and knowing how I can trust Him, is so that I can be about His will and His agenda in my life. Right, the whole order of, of that prayer, and obviously I can't go through the entire thing, and that really the point about the message today, but when He says, Pray your kingdom come, your will be done, and then give us today our daily bread. Our agenda is his agenda as we trust him for our needs. And as you engage the Father this year, I want to encourage you to engage him around his will being done. That you pray like he teaches us to pray, God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, Your will be done, and that's me directly engaging with that. And so some thoughts around that very quickly is as you pray, your kingdom come, it means maybe shifting some gears in your life, and some of those gears are are maybe needing to shift from consuming to participating. And what I mean by that is maybe you have been just attending here, and that's as far as it's gone for you. And as you engage with the Father and see what it means to engage with the Father and His will being done here is maybe being a part of making church happen. So joining any kind of team, serving team on a Sunday, kids ministry, next gen, uh, there's a branch out that serves the poor. There's, you just need to contact the office and get hold of Gene and you can find out where to plug in because there's a whole stack load of places that need people to use the gifts that God has given them to build up this church for His glory. And so maybe as you go, your will be done, 
It's going, okay, let me start participating in the kingdom. Man, five minutes is better than no minutes. One Sunday is better than no Sunday. But you're about his business as you go, okay, I can do this because he takes care of me. Maybe it's moving from isolation to community. We have groups that meet in the week where people risk. They risk emotionally as they dig into community. They allow people to speak into their lives and share their burdens as they do life together and go deeper around God's word. That might be terrifying for you. But it's how God has designed us to not be alone, but to be a part of community. And maybe that's a shift that you need to make as you be a part of his kingdom, that you start to actually engage in people's lives and be there for them and to help them in God's word and to encourage one another as we do life together. And maybe it's going, okay, I'm going to move from being inward focused to being outward focused in that it's great that we're here on a Sunday and never neglect meeting together with believers, but my heart is always for those who are not here today. As I walk the streets and I talk to people about Jesus, I have met so many people who just have never heard about Jesus in our city. They're your neighbor. They're your colleague. You know that some of them are even your family. They are the parents of your kids' friends. But so many people in our lives are facing an eternity without Jesus, who live this life without the joy of knowing that they have a father who loves them, who they can engage with. And I can not worry about the things in my life because he takes care of them and I can trust him to meet all of my needs because he's proven himself to be flawless in his track record with his people and I can lay aside those burdens and those anxieties and I can give them all to him and I can go, Jesus, I actually can be about your business. I can be about your kingdom and I can pursue those things because I can trust you with everything else. That's how he sees sets it up. And that's how I'm supposed to engage with him. I can pray about all my needs, but that's not what's supposed to consume me because he's proven how he takes care of that. And the weight of my engagement, the weight of my praying is praying your kingdom come, God give me today my daily bread. And so as you're thinking about this year, church, think about how are you engaging the Father based on the foundation he's laid for us, based on his track record of trust, how he's proven himself and we can lay our burdens and anxieties there, but then actually start to participate maybe in ways I never have before. Knowing what he's about and having the faith to do that. So as I close out and pray for us, what are your next steps going to be? Really think about this. What are your next faith steps going to be as you engage the Father? Are you really going to trust Him? You're going to take the heart of Matthew 6 when you pray, believing my Father sees me and He knows my needs. And so then I can engage with my Creator who spoke everything into being who calls me to be about his business, to pray his kingdom come, his will be done, knowing that he takes care of all of my needs. Father God, I am grateful for how you have proven yourself over and over and over again. Your word is so full of the evidence that you are flawless in the way that you take care of and sustain your people. And Jesus, I know because of the troubles that I have in my own heart. But God, I'm grateful that I can keep coming back to knowing that you provide for our needs. And I can trust you. So Jesus, for us as a church, I pray that you would help us to do that. And for every single person here that is concerned about their needs concerned about the, the future, concerned about what this year is going to look like and, and what we are worried about, our finances, our health, our relationships. Jesus, I pray that you would help us just to unburden them onto you because you take care of our needs. And if that's something you need to do, by faith, just in your hearts, do that. Just say, Jesus, I'm laying down my finances and I'm trusting that you are going to provide my daily bread. 
That's my finances. That's my health. That's my relationships. That Jesus, you are going to give me enough and it's going to sustain me. Even if it means praying, Jesus, don't let my shoes, the soles of my shoes wear out or my garments perish. And trust him with your daily bread. And maybe your next step is to say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to engage with your kingdom. I don't know what that's going to look like yet. I don't know what I have, but you call me to that, and, and so I'm going to participate, and I'm going to engage with you. And so pray, Jesus, help me to know what the next step is to take. I said, maybe that's just trying to serve in some way. Maybe it's joining a group. Maybe it's having the courage to talk to someone and say, I actually believe in Jesus. I want to tell you about my relationship with him and encourage you to think about that. But Jesus, there's no reason for us not to engage you. You just made it so easy and possible for us, and we thank you for that. So in your holy name, we pray this. Amen. I want to encourage you guys to really think about what your engagement is going to look like with the Father.